Dear friends in Christ, I invite you to please join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, we give thanks to you for blessing us with the opportunity to worship together and to praise your name. We thank you, Lord, for uniting us and knitting us together as your family. Help us each day to embody your love in what we say, what we do, the way we act toward one another. Help our behavior be that of becoming of Christians, that all may know who you are through our actions. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. The text for our sermon this morning is going to, be, going to be from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, so I hope you, hopefully if you have your bulletins handy, you can uh, glance at that on occasion. But uh, as, we, as we talk about our sermon this morning, as we talk about our message, I was thinking about uh, every year there's this event that happens. The beginning of the year, usually, uh, pretty early in the year, it's a huge celebration in Hollywood. It's a huge celebration where they praise one another, where they lift up one another. And it's uh, quite a sight to see, because if you turn on your television, you'll see as these stars, actors and actresses, put on tuxedos, put on dresses that are, well, let's put it this way, they're worth more than what you make in a year, some of them. They're pretty expensive. They stroll down the red carpets after leaving beautiful limousines. They're crowded by fans. The televisions of millions of viewers are glued to watch them exchange these golden trophies. And these trophies are exchanged for pretending. For who is the best pretender? Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm referring to the Academy Awards. It happened this year in about February of this year, where actors and actresses came together for that coveted golden trophy, the Oscar Award. They came together because they wanted to prove that they were the best pretenders, the greatest make-believe. And not only them, but, well, also the screenwriters, those who prepared in the shadows to make the most make-believe world as well. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because as we look at these people, as we look at what they're praised for, it's for pretending. It's for not being who they are. It's for their performance, abilities. It's for acting before others. Now in our world today, we might detest that a bit. We might look at that and we might say, we don't like hypocrites. We don't like actors. We don't like those who are not themselves. We want to see the real deal. And yet, as much as we may detest these folks, maybe there's a bit of, well, maybe we resemble them a bit at times. Oh, sure, we don't take a stage. We don't stand in front of an audience. But perhaps we've honed our skills in acting. We've learned how to perform. Society has taught us what is good behavior. We're rewarded when we get A's in schools. We're rewarded when we do well at work with promotions. We're rewarded, it seems, when our families are stable. We're punished when things don't go our way, when we misbehave at school, when we have judgmental attitudes, when we treat others poorly. So we've learned how to perform. We've learned how to act. We've learned how to pretend to show people what they want to see, what people like to see. Heaven forbid if they really ever saw the real us. Imagine for a moment if people saw the real you. You know the one I'm talking about, the real you, the, the one that only, that, that only in your mind, the real you who gets angry and frustrated and sometimes loses your temper but keeps it inside bundled up. The real you who has seen things on TV, on the internet, in public, that you would not repeat, and you've even enjoyed it. The real you who has thoughts that go through your mind every day, of things that no one wants to know. When you think about the real you, who is the real you? Who has seen the real you? Has most people just seen the pretender? The one who looks good on the outside. Most of us, we, we hide that real you because we know who the real you is. The real you, the real us, is, is a sinner. David refers to the real us in Psalm 51. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. And we know that instead of truth in our inmost place, instead of what is good and right, it is that sinner. It is that sinfulness. And because we are not just those who sin, 
We are not just those who commit sins, but we are sinners. The real us is the sinner. The real us is the one who has broken God's law time and again. The real us is the one who has thoughts that are sinful and that should not be repeated. The real us is the one who does those actions that we don't care to admit to. And that was the real us. That was the real us, fully and completely a sinner. A sinner who gave in to our old Adam or our old Eve. A sinner who only was willing to fulfill our desires, our wants to put ourselves first. A sinner who was unwilling to consider God's Word before our Word. Until that sinner was replaced with a new identity. It's not just a facade. It's not just a pretend change. But it is a real change. In Romans chapter 6, Paul reminds us that not only did we have to make that change in our identity, but God had to completely destroy that old identity. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. We, our identities have been changed. That that who we were, those, those people, those sinners that we were, have been exchanged with the identity of Christ through our baptism. And it is not just a small change, but that change is the change of giving us the identity of the perfect Lamb of God. Taking our sinner's sinful identities and replacing them with the holy identity of Christ on the cross. Because He took our falsehood, He took our lies, He took our sinful thoughts, and He nailed them to the cross. And He bore those pains so that our false faith would be exchanged for true faith. So that our falsehood would be exchanged for truth. So that we would be the people of God. And this is who Paul is addressing this morning. He is addressing not pretenders, but he is addressing the real people of God. He is not addressing actors, those who seem to want to play the role, but He is addressing those who want to live as the people of God. Those who have experienced the change of God in their lives. Those who have been sinners, who are sinners, but now have the forgiveness of sins. That is who Paul is addressing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And the very first place he goes is to address us in our need for peace. As the body of Christ, He encourages us towards peace. It seems like it should be such a simple thing. But it seems like if we could find this peace, well, the rest would fall into place. But so often we struggle to find peace. Because as much as we are redeemed people of God, we still, we have a habit of recognizing the failures and mistakes of others. We have a habit of recognizing the ways others have hurt us. We have a habit of not forgetting the way people have treated us. We have a habit of forgetting that we are sinners just like they are. And it's easy to look at other people's sin, to look at the way other people have harmed us, and point the finger and to blame them. Because when we blame them, then we can say it's their fault that there's not peace. If they would behave better, if they would do better, if they would act better. But it forgets that peace begins with the people of God. Peace begins with us. So often this dissension, this discord that has filled, our, filled churches, not just small local churches, but national churches, the whole church of God, this, this peace, this, or this dissension that has come in and, and replacing the peace, it's a tool of the devil. I take you back to Proverbs chapter 6. Solomon reminds us that God hates seven things. Well, he d- detests seven things. He hates six things. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to Him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a man who serves up dissension among his brothers. Each of those things in and of themselves destroy peace. But did you notice that last one? And a man who stirs up dissension among his brothers. God hates this dissension that is formed among us. The devil wields this dissension. He plants these seeds of dissension because he wants to separate us from one another. As long as there is unity in the body of Christ, we are, we are a foe that is to be reckoned with. 
But as long as we're divided, as long as we bicker, as long as we fight with one another, as long as we turn on one another, it gives the devil a foothold. It's what's called divide and conquer. Now this military strategy has been along, around for a long time. In fact, we, as far back as Greek and Roman times, and Chris, you might correct me because he's doing his paper on this, but we know that this idea of divide and conquer has been around. But our American soldiers actually experienced a very similar tactic in Vietnam when the Viet Cong and the, and the South Vietnam attacked them. They didn't, most of the time, take on a full battlefront. They, they discovered that they would lose quickly if they did that. Instead, they did what was guerrilla warfare, or for your Spanish speakers, small war. They would do ambushes, small attacks, pot shots, if you will, taking out small amounts of men. But over time, that adds up. That is exactly how the devil works. He works just in the same way. He takes small shots over time, dividing us here, there, and everywhere until he gets us alone and vulnerable. Then he goes ahead and he attacks. He drives right over us, tempting us, driving us to anger, to frustration, to pain, tempting us, driving us away from our faith in God. And all that's left is bickering. And all that's left is a broken family. See, he wants to destroy the church of God because together we are an unstoppable force. The church of God is the people of God are an unstoppable army. A people who cannot be put down. A people who will storm the gates of hell. And drive Satan back right to those gates. He doesn't want us to come together. He doesn't want us to come together in the no name of the Lord and in the power of the Spirit. Because he knows that he will lose. In fact, he knows he has lost. He lost a long time ago on that cross at Calvary. Because on that cross, Jesus did declare victory. Now there are skirmishes, yep. There's battles that go on, but the war is won. The war has been won. And so, people of God, that peace, that unity, it is an integral part of being the church of God. Paul starts there, but he doesn't stop there. He gives us a small list, but it is barely scratches the surface. He doesn't intend this to be a comprehensive list. But he says part of that peace means to encourage those who are weak. And at first he talks about those weak in their faith. Those who are idle. Those who have put aside the Word of God. Those who have put aside their worship. Those who have put aside the time of prayer. But we as the people of God need to encourage one another. When we know someone hasn't been in church, to lift them up. When we know someone hasn't been in the Word, to strengthen them. To share with them the Word. He gives us a second plan of attack here, and that is to encourage one another who are weaker physically, to lift up our brothers and sisters who are sick or in need, to fellowship with one another, to care for one another, to love one another, to pray for one another. He tells us to be patient with one another. This one I find uh, sometimes can be a struggle for even us as seasoned Christians, can't it? To be patient, to, to, to wait for one another, to put aside our own time, our own desires for a minute, to care for those who are lagging a little bit. But probably the hardest command right after peace is that last one. Do not repay evil for evil. Do not get revenge on one another. It may sound like something that is self-evident for us as Christian people. It may sound like, oh, Paul, well, of course that should be the case. But so often, even we as Christians, we desire that re revenge. We desire to get back what is owed us, what someone deserves. We need to put those things aside. Because those things create dissension, create division. Now, like I said, Paul, he gives us a small list, but he doesn't guarantee perfect peace because he can't. This side of eternity, we're still going to be pretenders at times. This side of eternity, we're still going to be people who are more worried about what people think about us than what our relationship with God is. This side of eternity, we need to constantly go back to the promise given us in our baptism. Go back to the promise given us at the cross. 
that our old self must be put to death so that our new self might live. So that that old Adam or old Eve might be drowned. So that we might live at peace with one another. And this is where it is significant. Because as people living at peace with one another, we too will stop looking at the ways that people in our congregation are different than us, the ways that churches outside of the Lutheran church are different than us, and instead seeing ways that God can work through His people of every race, every tongue, every nationality, every Christian denomination, how He can work through us together to proclaim the good news to proclaim the good news so that this, this peace is not just a peace that is a pie-in-the-sky dream, but it is the true peace of God which transcends all understanding. And I'd like to close today with just with a quote the, right at the end of Matthew chapter five, or 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 where Paul gives, us, gives the people of Thessalonica this encouragement. I think it's an excellent encouragement for us. May God Himself the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, forgive us for those times when we are pretenders. Forgive us for those times when we Turn our back on You in those times when we are most focused on ourselves. Forgive us for those times when we put ourselves first instead of being the body of Christ, sharing with others. But reassure us that You have known the real us. You have known the sinful us and You have exchanged that sin sinner with a saint. You have made us righteous, making us holy. Help us each day to live as Your holy people. Help us each day to live as those who, live, who not only speak Your Word, but through our behavior and through our actions, share Your Word. Help us to be those who share Your love and Your Gospel to the very ends of the earth. And may Your peace, which transcends all human understanding, guard and keep us now and forever. Amen. <laughs>